Fountainhead Forum 3, Charlotte Cushman talks about objectivism, Montessori, and the uh, growing woke problems in the woke movement. This is without video due to technical issues, but we will have the content and the sound. Thank you. How are you doing, Charlotte? Uh, tell me how you got into objectivism and Montessori. Well, the way that I got into Montessori was that I <clears throat> had majored in elementary education when I was in college. And I was uh, very frustrated with the classes that, not all of them, but most of the classes that I was taking in college because they weren't, well, let me say, for example, when I was a junior or a senior in college, they told us to pick a grade and then you were supposed to, and this grade was where you were going to be doing your student teaching. And then you would pick a unit that you were going to teach to these children. And, you know, I'm, I'm going, well, what? do third graders need to know? I don't know what they need to know. What should I show them and, and how do I teach it to them? You know, they expected us to just do this. And so I was really frustrated by that. And my sister was taking the Montessori training in Seattle at that time. And so she said, why don't you come and attend a couple of classes with me and see what you think? So I drove to Seattle from Portland and I sat in on a class with her and I was just literally blown away. They had a teacher sitting up in front of the room and she showed the class how to present a lesson to the children. And the lesson was how to pour water. And they, she talked about what the child needs to know before you present this lesson, um, how you prepare them for that lesson, and what to do if they are not successful at pouring water, how long you let them practice. Once they are successful in pouring water, um, well, how can you vary that lesson? How can you extend it into doing other things? If they spill water, what are they supposed to do? I mean, it was so detailed and so organized. And then um, another time I went to another class and it was this exact same way where they, they tell you, you know, how to prepare the child, um, how to show them how to do something, what to do if they don't understand it, how to extend it and vary the lesson. And it was so impressive. And so then my sister said to me, why don't you read this book? and see what you think. And the name of the book was Maria Montessori, Her Life and Works by E.M. Standing. And I read the book and I was just absolutely sold on it. So after I got out of college, I directly went into taking the Montessori training and I took it from Lena Whitmer-Rotney, who was a friend and colleague of Montessori. And it, I loved it. I loved the whole year of training because it was so logical and they taught you um, how, you know, reading, writing, math, geography, grammar, uh, grace and courtesy, uh, control and coordination of body, sensory education, um, science, the works. And in every case, the lessons went from concrete, step by step by step towards abstract. The child masters one step before he goes on to the next. And it was a lot of information, but it was easy in the sense that it all made sense to you. It was all very logical. Um, and I, you know, I just can't say enough about Montessori. It's just it's just absolutely fabulous. Well, then the way I got uh, involved in objectivism was in a similar way. Again, I was in college and a group of feminists, um, like for example, Gloria Steinem came to our college and talked about feminism for the entire weekend. 
and I hated it. And I uh, was very frustrated with it. So again, I wrote to my sister and her husband and I said, what is wrong with the world? Well, they didn't write me back, but they sent me a book. And the book was Atlas Shrugged. And when you opened the cover on the inside, it said, you sound ready for this now. So I read the book. It was during finals week too, by the way. So I should have been studying for my finals. Instead, I was reading Atlas Shrugged. And I would read until late into the night. And again, I loved it because it was so logical, just like Montessori. And uh, so that's how I got involved in objectivism. And then from there, I, my sister and her husband had recorded lectures that I listened to. And I read more of Ayn Rand's books. And, and uh, that's how that started. Yeah. So yeah, sounds uh, like a great journey. Uh, so let's uh, yeah. So let's move on to this. Uh, so you you so you had a Montessori school, a couple of Montessori schools for a while that you're organizing and operating, or right um, after I took the Montessori training, then I was an assistant um, in Portland, Oregon, for a year, and then I moved back to the Midwest. And I was an assistant in a, another Montessori school for a year, and then I became their head teacher. And I was at that school for 11 years. And then I, I had always had a dream of having my own school. So my best friend and I uh, started a school called Independence Montessori, and we taught. And it, she did most of the administrative work, and then I did most of the teaching, but she was my assistant. And then my husband started a elementary Montessori school. And when my best friend retired, then our classroom, we bought her out. And then my classroom became a part of his school. And then we worked together. So I taught and uh, for over 40 years. And um, then before I retired, I wrote the book, Montessori, Why It Matters for Your Child's Success and Happiness. And then I also wrote a children's book uh, called Your Life Belongs to You, which is the story of the founding of the United States based on John Ridpath's uh, speech at Ocon many years ago at Williamsburg. And then after I retired, I wrote Effective Discipline the Montessori Way. Um, so that's... So now I'm retired, but I'm still uh, involved in Montessori. I've uh, given talks to parent groups and teacher groups. And uh, we've since moved out of Minneapolis. And uh, locally, I've uh, been in touch with the Montessori school and have uh, offered to do some work for them from time to time. And um, then I also have gotten involved in this social justice uh, stuff that Montessori schools and Montessori organizations have been pushing. So, so I'm still very much involved and still very much uh, care about Montessori. Sounds like it definitely. Uh, you know, considering uh, the, you were obviously it was a while ago where you were in college, but you saw the, the you know the at least the beginnings of that. Now, uh, should we really be shocked by what's happened to the colleges? What's happened with the colleges right now with the going woke? Though, although as you said, it, it it does shock you that it's infected Montessori. Right, it does. I mean, well, I I mean it does and it doesn't. I mean, I could see years ago that there were, see, the thing about Montessori is it's got this element of freedom in it, and the child is free to pursue his own work, but it's only within limits. Well, you know, the hippies, and that was my era, was the hippie movement, they hear the word freedom and they think, oh, free to do whatever you want. So there were a lot of those kinds of teachers 
way back in the day. And, you know, I could see that they were just kind of following along. You know, I, I could see that aspect in them. I mean, you could see where, where that was going in the future. Um, but, you know, Montessori itself, the, the educational method is so wonderful and it works so well that it surprises me that they, that the leaders, that the educators, um, you know, the teacher educators, that these, you know, like AMI and AMS, that they are um, falling into this social justice thing when number one, they should be setting the standard. They should be setting the standards because they are this, you know, Montessori is the, is the successful system. So why are, why are we caving in to the, the things that are going on that are very unsuccessful? So that's what's frustrating about it. But yes. Do you think there could be a, a, you know, money coming in or is it just a, you know, is it intellectual corruption or maybe more financial corruption where, just bad apples have gotten to the top or is it a case where, you know, somebody who's very unprincipled is giving is funneling money into this? Well, that's a good question. I don't know, but my suspicion is it's just intellectual corruption. You know, I think the majority of people, even, I mean, even if they like Ayn Rand or even if they read her book, her works and they really love the logic and the reason and the fact that it's based on reason doesn't mean that they can think things through real clearly themselves. And so, you know, it, the problem is that most people were educated by hearing there's no such thing as truth. There's no such thing as objective truth. Well, so then what do they rely on? They rely on what other people say. And I, and, you know, there's a lot of that where they just kind of go along with, you know, the current trend, which is sickening. Yeah. What were what were some of the examples that, you know, showed you that the, the Montessori movement has gone woke? Well, one of the best examples is all the conferences that they have sponsored. AMI, AMS. Um, they've yes. had, they have sponsored a lot of conferences. Here, let me go over. Yeah, maybe you could explain to us, uh, explain to the audience the AMI, AMS. Those are two different Montessori organizations with oh, uh, that have okay. slightly different approaches. Right. Okay. So when Maria Montessori was alive, she was very worried that her method would be watered down, or that people who wouldn't uh, understand it would misapply it. So she and I don't know, some other people started an organization called Association Montessori International, and we refer to it as AMI. And the purpose of that organization was to keep Montessori pure. And their position was that a child is a child is a child. And no matter where they are in the world, they have all the same uh, underlying uh, characteristics and the way that they learn and stuff like that. And so um, you adhere to the Montessori principles no matter where you are in the world. And in the meantime, in the United States, there was a woman who I can't remember her name. Um, she uh, loved Montessori and was getting it going in the United States. And I think she had her own training center. I'm not sure about that. But at any rate, she was involved in starting an organization called um, AMS, um, American Montessori Society. And their position was, well, now, now, wait a minute. Not everybody in the world, not every child in the world is basically the same because in the United States, children play with uh, sensory toys at a younger age than most of the rest of the children do in the world. So therefore the American child is just a little bit farther ahead. Well, um, 
both of these organizations have their advantages and disadvantages. The advantage to AMI is that they are very well um, informed about the basic principles. The AMS, um, their advantage is that they can be, they are a little more creative. Um, like, for example, the color coding in the Montessori classrooms <clears throat> apparently came from some AMS people. And the disadvantage to AMI is that they can be uh, very dogmatic. And if somebody develops a new material or a new idea, they may not accept it because it was not uh, available when Maria Montessori was alive. You know, they don't look at, well, does this new material follow the same basic principles? Does it meet the child sensitive periods? You know, they, they don't go through the principles and see if that new material or that new idea follows those principles. So, you know, they can be more rigid and that's a disadvantage to them. The disadvantage to AMS <laughs> is that they don't always understand or abide by the principles, Montessori principles that they should be. Um, so uh, that, but it's good to have those two organizations because they keep each other on their toes. There's a little bit of competition between them and, and uh, they keep each other honest. Yes. But the problem is now both those organizations have gone for the social justice movement and I think I have the impression that they those are also watered down now. And, you know, that's not good. Yes, and it's, it's important to note that Dr. Montessori died in 1952. So obviously we've had quite a few technical advances since then. I mean, even in 1952, you had a lot of a lot of children who, who might have grown up in TVs in homes that did not have TVs. So. Obviously, you, you do need to adjust to the to those things. Uh, so and you said as the conferences, what was this a slow was this a slow development or did it just kind of happen overnight? With the wokeness infecting the, the Montessori conferences and, and organizations. Are you there still? Yes, I'm still here. I said, did the wokeness happen? Did it happen overnight or was it very gradual? Well, I, I don't know. It kind of hit me all of a sudden when I was, I can't remember whether somebody alerted me to it. I have a friend who I used to work with. She was my assistant in my classroom for a year and she now has gone on to become her, she teaches elementary Montessori and now she's going for her doctorate and she keeps me up to date on what's happening. And I don't remember if she alerted me to it or if I, when I was cruising around on the internet that I discovered it, but uh, it, it may have been a gradual thing, but in uh, the website for AMI in 2018 states that Montessori for Social Justice is, quote, dedicated to promoting anti-biased, anti-racist Montessori education. They bring together Montessorians of all trainings to work towards ed educational equity and the success of all children. I couldn't believe it. Yes. You know, because... like, like, we're not, we're not, like, whoever said that we weren't, that, that it doesn't happen in the Montessori classroom where children all get along and they view each other as individuals and you know it's it's so ridiculous i mean i had no no idea that montessori was a biased racist educational system or that it wasn't for the success of all children it is yeah and there certainly wasn't a uh, there certainly wasn't anything uh in, in there that was biased in the first place so yes so why would it uh it, it almost seems as though they want to try to equalize outcomes, which I don't believe is, is possible. I mean, obviously, you know, as a, as a Montessori director, you've, you've certainly realized that there are just some kids that are different than others for whatever reasons. 
Yeah, they're all individuals. Yes. And why would you want everybody to be the same anyway? That's boring. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's, I think it's often, you know, motivated by a destruction of, of achievement and just a desire to bring us all down to the lowest common denominator solution. Uh, what was, uh, how did the Montessori organizations react to the uh, insanity of 2020? Uh, did they pretty much fall in or I, I guess in some cases they had to, is there any, any pushback from Montessori schools because of this or, or not? Uh, I don't know. I don't know how involved they got in that. Although my friend that I was telling you about was at a conference uh, around that time, or maybe it was during that time. And yeah, they seem to be supportive of of what was. She said they, you know, a lot of talk and genders, and uh, it's just sickening. But yeah. her, her class, her lecture that day was canceled or postponed was going on during those riots you know it was like paying respect or some stupid thing i'd have to ask her to refresh my memory. yeah yeah it's hard to say too you know if they uh, but yeah it's very hard to say uh how how, do, how does uh obviously this is before they get to montessori schools but how has all seeing people wearing all these masks how has that ha affected children and the development of their speech and the development of their talking if they're not seeing lips and not seeing mouths yeah well <clears throat> that has come about since i've retired so i have not experienced that directly but from what uh teachers have reported to me it's very it's very detrimental because for exactly those reasons that you just stated they have to see your mouth they have to see your facial expressions um, oh, you know what? I forgot. I have subbed in classrooms when uh, at towards the end of COVID, where most of the children were not wearing masks, but there were you know four to six kids in the class whose parents wanted them to continue to wear masks, and they did. Yeah. So I did experience it a little bit, but you know not to the extent that these other teachers had reported to me that it was very detrimental. How 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 is that impact? How are the kids interacting? I mean, uh, obviously you have some kids who probably have parents who think that all of the COVID hysteria was insane, and then you have some kids who have parents who bought into all of it. Uh, is that are, are you seeing? Are you know are kids making fun of kids wearing? Are kids not wearing masks making fun of kids wearing masks? Or is is there anything like that or, or not? I yeah, I didn't see any of that. See, the thing is in Montessori, it's all based on the individual and they accept each other as individuals. So some of them are wearing masks, some of them aren't. And I, you know, maybe there have been some arguments among the children, but I, I haven't heard of it and I haven't seen it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Obviously, you're retired, but you certainly, even though you're retired, you're certainly very passionate about all of this. Uh, so, what what do you think would be a prescription to to fix what's happening in the Montessori system? And you know, or and you know, also, would there a way to fix everything else? You know, like the colleges and all that stuff, because it's and it's certainly probably and it's certainly the wokeness has affected the public schools as well, and and many of our other institutions. Well, what I did was, <clears throat> I guess I have to backtrack a little bit. I was accepted to speak at a Montessori conference in uh, Colorado. And it actually, it was this month. Or, or was it the year before? Oh, I can't remember for sure. But anyway, um, it, oh, yeah, it was postponed because of COVID. Well, and then in the meantime, I found out about how all, you know, AMI and AMS and these other Montessori organizations have caved into the social justice thing. So I wrote an article for American Thinker 
that kind of gave him a blast for that. And uh, it, they found out about it. And so they canceled me. Well, then I wrote a letter in response to that. And I sent that to the American Thinker and that was published. So they're not very happy with me right now. Then I uh, established a website to help parents and teachers who are opposed to this, um, in encouraging them to fight it. And the name of the website is AuthenticMontessoriEducation.com. And, uh, I, you know, it, it's, it's got to be us at the ground up. We've got to protest it. We've got to speak up. And there were some teachers that um, contacted me and were, were very, very happy that I spoke up. So we've just got to keep pressing on. My friend who is now trying to get her, you know, working towards getting her doctorate, I'm hearing from her almost every day. They are telling them that um, sensations are superior to reason and all kinds of stuff. And, we, you know, we've got direct quotes from Montessori who said that, you know, reason is man's distinguishing characteristic. A child starts with nothing and then he, he builds up his reason. And, yes. I, you know, it's just ridiculous. It's, it's a hard fight, but we've got to fight it. There's no other way. We've just got to keep keep at it. Yes. Uh, uh, from what I've heard, uh, Montessori, actually, this isn't the first time Montessori has been politicized. Apparently, at one point, Benito Mussolini was a big fan of Dr. Montessori and even wanted to pu push her methods, which seems rather <laughs> contrary yeah. to his beliefs. But, apparent, but apparently, that's what I've heard. Is that correct or not? Yes, that is correct. And the reason why... He wanted to uh, use her was because her children did so well. You know, she, her schools had an excellent reputation for children who were reading at an early age and, you know, doing all these wonderful things. But she rejected him. She said uh, no, and she left the country. Yes. Uh, is, is she still... Uh is she still very well, very popular? Is she popular in Italy now, or is she not? Or is just just yeah? What's her status in Italy right now? And apparently, she's somewhat revered. I know. I know she was also the first medical doctor, I believe, in the history in the history of the country. Yes. Yeah, she was. I, I don't know. Or female medical doctor, I should say. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and not only that, but she was a very very hard worker, very independent, and. Her father was opposed to her becoming a doctor, and but she went ahead and did it anyway. There were days where there would be blizzards. She would be the only one that would show up to class on those days. She's very driven, very, very independent. And even in, and then when it came to the point where girls were not supposed to go to school anymore, she insisted on continuing. So, yeah, she was quite the person. Yeah, yeah it's a remarkable, a remarkable life. Yes, indeed. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, what do you think about? Think of some other. So, so, I don't think there's much left to be said about wokeness. What do you think about some other uh, other movements out there, like the homeschooling movements, the unschooling movements, uh, peaceful parenting, and of course, uh, Lenore Skenazy and, and free range kids. Uh, oh, okay. It, yeah, it's yeah, because yeah, yeah. I'd love to. I guess I should. We'll go one at a time. What What do you think about peaceful parenting? Well, you know what, yeah. is that the one where you don't say no to a child and you don't give them consequences for misbehavior? What What exactly is peaceful I, parenting? I think it's some. I think mainly it's just to try to not be violent, but I, I and not yell, but to to to. to because obviously I don't know if you can, but it, it seems to be, but that seems to be one thing. It's uh, I, I know Stefan Molyneux is a big proponent of it. And I don't know. Are you aware also of Dana Martin? No. Oh, that's, oh, okay. That's another woman. Yeah. So maybe, I don't know. What do you, what do you think about the homeschooling and unschooling movements? Well, I don't know what un, 
Oh, the unschooling. Oh, okay. Well, yes. homeschooling, I think it's great. I think if, I mean, my first choice, the best choice for a child is Montessori, hands down. Yes. But not everybody can afford it. Um, not everybody has access to a Montessori school. Not all Montessori schools are necessarily good. And if you don't have any other option, uh, I think homeschooling is is really good. You know, the, for me personally, I think it would be very uh, overwhelming. You know, if you if you don't have have any experience or any knowledge about what a child needs to know at each age, or if you don't have any knowledge about how to go about it, um, I think it would be difficult. But I sure don't want. I would want to put my kids in public school. Yeah. Especially now. Yeah, I think I think I think for a lot of, you know, it's, it, one thing is that is that maybe you know a lot of unschoolers believe that kids are going to learn, you know, in, in almost any environment that their their natural curiosity is going to take over, and you know, and you know, and they will just you know they will just learn, and they'll learn naturally. They'll they'll learn how to do this. They'll learn. You know, if they want to, once they learn to read, they'll go pick up a book. And if they have a library nearby, they'll they'll go to the library. Yeah, you know those kinds of things, and, and kids right. will figure those things out on their own. And it's amazing how kids do do sometimes figure out things on their own. Well, uh, my under, my understanding of home of unschooling is that you, yeah. they don't have any school at all, and I don't agree with that because yeah, they need guidance. And they don't know what they need to know when they grow up. So, and, you know, you know, even though most children will do, like you say, their curiosity is going to drive them. Well, it might, might not drive them towards some of the things that they need to know. I mean, maybe it drives them towards math, but they need to know how to read. Yes. Know? So, yeah. I, you know, I don't support that. Yeah. I, you know, I'm still amazed in a lot of, in a lot of the more primitive countries where a lot of kids don't learn how to swim. And I think, you know, I think learning how to swim is a, one thing that you're, you really do need to learn just because you don't know when your kids are going to be in, in a situation in which they, in which knowing how to swim and having some confidence in the water is going to be going to save their life possibly. Right. Especially if they live in an area where there's a lot yeah. of lakes or near the ocean or wherever. And for that matter, you could even teach, you know, even teach little kids basic first aid, you know, this is how you put on a bandage. This is how you, yeah, you know, what not to do. Uh, certainly. Yeah. Uh, you know, another thing that's changed though in our times, and I, I think that's a, a very disturbing trend in, in the more modern world. And uh, you know, my, my grandfather, walked two miles to school each way as a first grader. And now we, we, we have this society where children are so protected and sheltered that they're not really learning how to do anything. And we're actually, and their, and their growth is actually being stunted. I mean, you know, I, and, and even going, and even, you know, in some parts of the world today, I can go to Peru and in the Amazon, I will see kids maybe five or six years old, piloting canoes by themselves and and they are not wearing life jackets so so what what do you think about that i mean where, where do we get the balance here and how, how did we get this way and how do we get back to a more sensible you know the, you know you're probably aware you know of the free range kids movement with lenore skenazy you know yeah i am aware of that and <clears throat> i'm not really in favor of the free range movement either because they do need uh, some safety uh, measures and they do need, you know, it depends on their age too, you know, but they, there are certain ages where they need to be watched all the time or they're really going to get hurt. Um, I mean, I, but I do agree with the free range in the sense that they can do more and they can have more independence than a lot of people think they can. But you have to judge, you know, as they grow up, you know, can they handle uh, being alone for an hour? Can they handle, you know, doing 
certain things. Um, you know, I when I was little, I used to walk two, three blocks to and from school, starting in kindergarten. And I, you know, I, and I agree with you. I, there's a lot of that that is gone now that is really sad. It, those are the kind of independence things that kids need to learn. But I don't agree that you just completely let them go. Yeah, because I, I don't think any parents are advocating that. But I, I but I also agree. You know, it's a, you know, a, you know, of just and 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 what and part of the problem is too is it seems like you know it's a case where they're they're afraid of what some bureaucrat is going to do. Uh, you, know, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I don't think we should, you know, still take our seven-year-olds to the bathroom, for example. Yeah. Now, now, if, uh, now, if a three, if my three, if I had a three-year-old and said, I think I can go to the toilet by myself, I might, I might say, okay, I'll let you go and maybe, you know, watch and be there. It's, uh, you know, that's one thing sometimes too, is you, you let them go, but you watch. It depends if they're just beginning to learn how to toilet themselves then you might want to go with them or you could ask, do you yeah. want me to help? But once they've mastered it, there's no reason to follow them into the bathroom. Yeah. You know? Yes, certainly. Yeah. And it just, it totally depends on the context. But, yeah. from what I, but from what I have read about free range kids, their philosophy is you just completely let them go. Yeah. I, well, I don't think that's, I, I don't think that's the full, I don't think that's necessarily the full philosophy. I think it's just, you know, getting back to some kind of normalcy though. Uh, well, obviously we have to find the right balance. I mean, I, I, I was left in the, you know, in, in the car with the motor running once, uh, you know, for like five minutes. And, you know, nowadays, you know, somebody would call the police on something like that. Yeah. And, and in my, and in my days, you know, it was just, you know, people realize parents are busy. And, and I sometimes wonder if that's part of the issue is that we have when you're in a society where you have a lot of people, I wonder, is it, is it non-parents calling the police on parents? I, I wonder if that's the case or, you know, you know, but, but. but well, that, that could be very well be it, but I think there are a lot of busy bodies. Yeah. Uh, and busy bodies who are parents and, you know, the, it's just like, I was just watching a video the other day of these kids, they had a lemonade stand outside and a neighbor from down the street and she was a mother came and took the children's money away because they weren't doing it right. Because they were using their bare hands to reach for the ice to put in the cup and stuff like that. It was ridiculous. And, you know, so it's, it's both, I'm sure, you know, non-parents. and But this was, you know, some people think they know it all and they know how everybody should do things and it should be their way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I sometimes wonder if you ever feel the temptation to just go up and say, take that mask off your kid. <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, my, my, I've long had this rule of do not interfere with parents, but it's really been tested during, during the last two, two and a half years, <laughs> but yes, you know, just don't be the busybody. Uh, what do you think nowadays too? And, and obviously you don't work with older kids, but nowadays that we have, I think every once in a while, kids probably go through their, you know, their, their, their a boy might have a day, a day when his life where he wants to be a girl, a girl wants to, might, may want to be a boy. What do you think now of this, I mean, now we're, oh, we're going to let, you know, kids at 12 go on hormone blockers or whatever. I mean, what do you make of this? It, well, that's child abuse to let them do yeah. that. Yeah. You know, there, there's such a thing as reality and it's a slap at reality. We're either born female or male. And also this is a Marxist thing. You know, this, this stems from the ideology of Marxism. You, you try to stir you get everybody confused. You get. Yeah. That everything is a social construct. And he's got a ton of uh, podcasts about what's really going on here. And it's, it's very disturbing and very frightening. You know, I had 
uh, a boy once, he was a twin and he loved the color pink and he loved pretty girls. And he came to, uh, on a, for our Halloween party, he came dressed up as a pretty pink princess. And, you know, I could just see these people saying, oh, well, he really needs to be a girl and blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? A year later, his mom told me it had passed. The thing is, he liked pretty things. So I've also had girls, a couple of girls that came dressed up as superheroes. So that doesn't mean they should be boys. This whole thing, this whole movement is so ridiculous. I mean, kids are just in the process of learning about reality and learning about life and and they're they're screwing them up big time. Yeah. Where do you you know, thinking back to the teenage Ayn Rand witnessing the her father's pharmacy being nationalized and then watching the Russian Civil War. Where do you think kids are going to be after the mass hysteria of the last three years? Do you think they're going to lead or lead some type of rebellion against all this? Although it, although it might be a while before they can do it, or, I mean, uh, where do you think these kids, I mean, and you know, where are the kids going to end? What, what are the kids going to believe 20 years from now, the kids who had their proms canceled for no reason, you know? You know what? You cut out for a little bit. Can you, can you repeat that again? Yeah. Your question? Yeah. yeah. Where, where do you think the kids are going to be who had their proms canceled for no reason? Uh, you know, you know, things like that. Where do you think they're going to be? Well, I don't know that it, if their prompts are canceled, that that should be a life altering situation. But if they're canceled for, uh, you know, a nonsensical reason, they have a right to be upset about it. But but I think, but I think the kids are going to, I think the kids, you know, are going to, you know, what kind of ideas are they going to have about government? What kind of ideas are they going to have about society? I mean, if you look back to how Ayn Rand was shaped by watching her father's pharmacy get nationalized and oh. see the Russian civil war. Yeah, I see what you mean. But I don't know that are all kids really aware of what's going on other than what they've been told or other than what they see on TV. It, it depends on how, how aware they are of the facts and how, how are they able to really think about those things? Yes, but the, certainly they'll, certainly they'll pursue, you know, they'll certainly try to find the answers. At least I hope they will. I, yeah, I and sure. And they have a lot more resources available to them today. Um, unlike, you know, you know, unlike Ayn Rand did. Uh, what do you, what do you think about early, uh, early language education? Uh, when, when do you think, do you have any opinions on when kids can start to learn a second language? Because it seems like in America, we probably wait too long for this and we don't really have, um, um, I mean, most Americans are monolingual and that's definitely not the case in Europe where people are bilingual or even more. Well, again, it's contextual. Um, children who have a language processing problem, um, I don't think that uh, learning more than their native tongue is valuable to them. It can even hold them back. We had children in school where they spoke English at school, but they spoke a different language at home. And then when they started to learn how to read, they had a lot of problems. So what I, when I was teaching, what I advised parents in those situations to do is I said, speak one language at breakfast and another language at dinner. Don't intersperse the two because the, the child gets the order of language all mixed up. Um, so, yes. you know, you have to be kind of careful about that. Now, the sensitive period for language, uh, I think it goes up to about age 10. 
So if you wait until first grade to teach a child a second language, that is not too late. And by then, hopefully, if a child has a language delay, hopefully by first grade it will be much better or taken care of, or maybe they might be over it. But it depends, you know, on the on the child. I, you know, there's been this big push to insert a second language uh, at the children's house level. The children's house level is ages two to six um, in Montessori. And I, you know, I, I'm just hesitant about that because not every child in that class is, it's not gonna be beneficial for every, every child. Most yeah. of the kids probably yes, but not all of them. Do you remember that show Thea Allegre? No. It was on PBS. It was a, a show where they actually mixed English and Spanish. I remember loving it. It was a, I think I found one, one video of it out there. I don't know. Is there anything out there? You know, you know what, 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 that's curious. What do you think of some of those PBS? I mean, you know, I grew up watching, you know, Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers, Electric Company. What did you think of some of those shows? Do you think they, what, what do you think were some really good materials or some really bad materials out there that were that were popular? Well, I, I uh, liked uh, some of Sesame Street's music and I used some of it in my classroom. They had some great songs and they had very cute, adorable, even funny characters. And again, I used their music in, in my classroom, but the show, I did not like the show. Okay. Because it was too, they went too quick from subject to subject to subject. And what we're trying to do with children at that age is increase their concentration. We're not trying to have it go bing, 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 bing. You know, I mean, it's like the child just starts to focus on numbers and then they go, and then, you know, the big bird is talking about something and they just start to focus on that. And then they switch and they kept switching. And I thought, you know, that's hard enough for the adult brain, let alone a little kid's brain. So I see what you mean. Yeah. And that's very interesting. Yeah. No, Miss Rogers, I personally did not like him because I thought he was effeminate. But I know that a lot of parents uh, liked him because he was so relaxed and soft. And um, I know that some children really liked him because of that aspect. So I can see, I can understand the positives about him, but I remember one time seeing him file his fingernails on the show. And I mean, he was just sitting there talking to the kids, filing his nails. And I thought, Oh my gosh, <laughs> I don't like this. <laughs> you know, I yeah, yeah, he was a, yeah, he was certainly a, and yeah, I grew, I, I grew up near Pittsburgh, and he was from Pittsburgh, and he was so, so loved in Pittsburgh. It was, and apparently, he had some, he had some really good things to say too. Uh, I, yeah, there was a quote by him about, oh, what was it about independence or thinking on your own yeah. or I don't remember what it was, but it was fabulous. I, and, so and he I had. Didn't... He yeah. had some good aspects to him. Yeah, and I don't, and and you know, I often wonder if this story is necessarily true or not. But apparently, there was a. The story was that his car was stolen, and, and of course, because it's you know, it, it made the news and said, "Oh, Mister Rogers' car was stolen." And apparently, the next day, the car was back in the same space with a sign that said, "If we'd known it was yours, we would not have taken it." <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> Well, I grew up with Captain Kangaroo. Oh, yes. And, and I don't remember enough about that to really judge it now as an adult. But as a, as a child, I really liked it. And, yeah, and, I, and, you know, a lot of this has probably, probably been lost, I suppose. Uh, because, they, I mean, the TV shows. Yeah. I mean, which is kind of sad, but I, I mean, and, and who can imagine some of the other stuff? I mean, there was also... Uh, I never watched Romper Room. I remember, I, I do remember, and unfortunately, you know, and you know, unfortunately, you know, Saturday morning cartoons, which were just really kind of a a vast wasteland, but they were some somewhat educational. But I, uh, you know, and 
uh, you know, electric, and, you know, I remember electric company. You know, that, that was, that was the first place where I saw Rita Moreno and Bill Cosby, you know, was on that show. It was a, and, and it's so sad to see what's happened with Cosby because I, because I, I wonder if what all that stuff he did with the education of children will just be completely forgotten. And he did a lot of good stuff like that. But anyway, uh, what do you, uh, what do you, th I, I assume also you're very much an advocate of phonics. Oh yes. Learning to read. Oh yes. I, where, where are we with that right now? Is it, are, I mean, are kids learning phonics or are they, Still going through educational malpractice and not learning phonics. I mean, right. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I yeah. would imagine that probably varies from state to state, maybe from school to school. The last I knew, when I was teaching, they were not using it in the public schools. Yeah. Um, but you know, I don't know if that's universal across the nation or, or what. I had already learned to read by the time I got to school. I do remember uh, specifically in a Catholic school that they were still with phonics. So that was one good thing. I mean, the, the Catholic, and so, although overall my experiences in public schools were better than Catholic schools, but I do have to give, uh, but I, but the Catholic schools are also dealing with parents who are more engaged. And, but I do think they do have better results also because they can, they can, they do seem to achieve academically higher. I think maybe that's because of it, but also because they can they can just boot out their discipline problems while the public schools can't. Uh, you know, but uh, what a, uh, you know, I knew a guy back in a, a guy, one guy used to run for office here in Austin. He was a big advocate of letting kids keep their textbooks because uh, apparently they do that in Japan. Are there? What do you think of a program like that, or, or do you think there are any other models out there that are working very well in, in education nowadays? Well, you cut out again, so I missed. <laughs> I missed uh, do you think there are any other models out there that are working really well in education nowadays all around the world? Uh, other uh, than other than Montessori, you mean? Yeah, other than Montessori. I mean, any other methods or any other or any other countries where they're doing it right or any particular areas where you think they're doing it right or any areas where you think they're really doing it wrong? Well, most education practices focus on, they think that learning is just memorizing, memorizing <laughs> things. And I, I think all those are really bad because they, children don't learn how to think when they're just memorizing and regurgi regurgitating information back. Um, now, I was in Japan when I was in college and those kids starting really young, I would say elementary school, they come home from school and they, after they eat dinner, they hit the books until they go to bed every mm -hmm. night. And um, from what I knew then, they were, you know, the, the Japanese were really excelling in academics and stuff. Now, I don't know. I don't think that's, I mean, if, if the child really enjoys doing that, that's one thing, but to pressure them like that. Yeah. I, I don't like that idea. Yeah. And this is unfortunately why I think in some Asian cultures, there's probably a higher, uh, there, there seems to be more suicide in some of them because the kids are so, uh, uh, you know, a good example, you know, also is the baseball player Ichiru. I, I mean, Apparently he does not talk to his dad at all because his his dad just was such a, a disciplinarian and, and and wanted him to be a great baseball player, which obviously became one. But it, it was so pressured on him of, you know, his father building the, you know, building the perfect ball player. It's a, and obviously that doesn't work. And I don't know, you could probably go on a, you know, go on another tangent here, you know, if you want to talk about crazy sports dads, <laughs> but that's usually at a, a later age or even crazy sports moms. Yeah, you know, really, what is the goal? The goal for parents like that is they want other parents to look at them and say, gee, what a great dad. Gee, what a great mom. Look at what their kids are doing. Yeah. So they're using their kids as, you know, a reflection of themselves so they can draw attention to themselves. 
and that's not okay. You yes. know, your child. I mean, I think it's a good thing to um, try to instill a good work ethic in your child. I just got finished reading Christy Nome's uh, book, and that's how she was raised. Where her dad was, he was very firm with the kids. They lived on a farm. They uh, they all had their jobs to do and they were expected to do them. And she said now as an adult, she's very thankful that she was raised that way, you know, because she likes to work and um, her her family thrived on work. You know, you don't get self-esteem by just sitting around. You get it by accomplishing things. And so I think if parents try to instill that in their children, that's how they're going to feel good about themselves. Yes. But to put them under all this pressure, yeah. that's just going to make them feel anxious. Yeah. And, and I think one thing too, is some of these other pressured kids, uh, uh, the kids, it, it's often, I, 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 what, I admire Japan because while they don't really invent things, they, they take our inventions and make them better. But I mean, and I've even heard some people in Japan, they wonder why, why don't we have a Thomas Edison or a, and to be a Thomas Edison, you have to be a little, you have to be a hard worker, but you also have to be a little bit of a, a little bit rebellious and a little bit willing to go against the, the grain, so to speak. And, yeah. And Edison was, you know, considered a, a failure in the school systems. I mean, that's uh you know, he said, you're, we can't educate this child. Get him out of here. So, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. What What do you think about some of these alleged, uh, you know, we didn't hear, hear about these things, but, you know, ADHD, Asperger's, uh, nowadays everybody has autism. What do you think about all of this? Is this? Oh, it, my gosh. I, it's so funny that you'd bring that up because as I was, as I went through my years teaching, I noticed that I noticed that uh, attention deficit was on the rise. It was like almost every child you knew, you know, the ones that had trouble concentrating had ADHD and uh, they were on drugs or a special diet or this or that. And then there was this rise in Asperger's and then you didn't hear about attention deficit anymore. It was Everybody had Asperger's, and I and I've really wondered about that. Well, I had a child who had autism. His mother told me he was completely normal until he got a vaccine. And you know, I know a lot of people are saying that oh, they've been thoroughly tested, and there's no relationship between vaccines and autism. But I also know that in 1984. Fauci took over the NIH, and it was since that time that some of these weird things started happening. So I, re I just really wonder about it. I mean, I don't know, yeah. but I'd like to know. <laughs> uh, that's that's a, that's a very interesting question. It's funny how we still end up bringing up. And, you know, I, I got through the uh, – but sometimes I wonder, too, if a lot of this is just saying – Oh, let's get the kids on these prescriptions and uh, to solve their problem. And I mean, twenty somethings nowadays who've really been screwed up because they had these you know, prescriptions. Yep, on. I I agree wholeheartedly. And, but I'll tell but I'll tell you something else. I had a child who was uh, six years old. He was having trouble reading. He could sound out words, but he was not actually reading yet. He left me, he went into first grade. But during that summer, um, I met his mother. We we hooked up at a dog training school. <laughs> she had a puppy and we had a puppy. And so uh, we. it was just a coincidence that we met up there. Yeah. Well, she told me that they had had him tested for uh, attention deficit. Now, another thing about this kid was he was very well behaved. You know, a lot of children that have concentration problems um, have, a, you know, they, they have a lot of behavior issues as well. But he didn't have any behavior issues. He was a really nice kid, and 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 he 
was well behaved and all that. The, his problem was he'd sit down to read and he'd be struggling sounding out words. So they had him tested, found out that he had attention deficit and they put him on, it may have been Ritalin. And she said, you know, Shar, we, every day we send him to school. As soon as we started him on Ritalin, she said, he's not sounding out words anymore. He's reading. Not only is he reading, he's reading sentences. Not only is he reading them, he's reading them competently. But she said, on the weekends, we don't give him Ritalin. And he could barely sound out a three-letter word. Wow. So, you know, there is, I totally agree that they're over-medicating kids and they're using it as an excuse. I mean, a lot of kids are really active. A lot of kids... Yeah don't know how to concentrate yet it's some learning how to concentrate or concentration is something that's learned and the sensitive period for it is you know three to four years of age and what happens to these kids when they get beyond that sensitive period then it's harder for them to learn how to concentrate so i totally agree but there are some kids that do need that little bit of extra nudge and he was one of them yeah, I never would have guessed because he was well behaved. I also wonder too if maybe they're maybe it's also what parents are feeding their kids. I mean, some kid. I mean, I've known kids who just didn't get any good food at all growing up, and they were never, and they were always in, eating junk. And then I, I don't know how much you know. I personally, if I, I can help it, I'll, I'll never give my, I'll never let my kids have any sugar if I can help it. Cause sure. I mean, I, I agree with what Arnold Schwarzenegger says. Sugar is just white death, but you know, do you think that has an impact on it or not? Or well, anything, it, anything like that? It certainly could. I mean, it would make sense because I mean, I just know for myself when I'm not feeling well, I have a harder time concentrating and if they eat a food that they're allergic to, that and it doesn't necessarily, I mean, I think sugar is probably a big uh, component in that, but it could be something else. Maybe they're allergic to uh, wheat or maybe they're allergic to milk, you know, they could be allergic to dairy. And so therefore they have a hard time focusing. Yeah. So uh, what, do, yeah. So, what, do you think another thing too, though, is that maybe it seems as though in, in the richer societies, when especially when you're talking about Christine Ohm, is that so many kids aren't doing chores, and it seems like kids have have it a little too easy, and they're and they're just not. One guy calls it snow plow parenting. You know, you plow the snow so so they don't have to struggle with learning to walk through the snow. But if the kids never have to struggle, then they, they really can't really face life later when they do struggle. Totally agree. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Do you think there are any other things that are valuable for children to do? I mean, do you think it's important? I mean, I mean, do you think kids are better off if they learn how to play play an instrument, or if they're better off with pets? Uh, you know, at well, any age. you know, as many experiences as they can have growing up, I think is valuable. Um. I think pets can be really a good experience for the chi the shy child, um, maybe a child who has trouble communicating with people or talking to people. And then they have a little pet and somebody comes up to them on the street and goes, oh, your little puppy is so cute. What's his name? And then the child has to respond. You know, so it kind of gives them an experience yeah. in, you know, talking to people and, and then talking to his puppy, you know, stuff like that. And, and a musical instrument is, uh, you know, a lot of fun. Now, a lot of these experiences are going to depend, too, on, on the family and, and uh, the, the child. Maybe the child has absolutely zero interest in playing an instrument. But, you know, we tried with our kids growing up, we'd take them to plays you know, live plays and take them to the zoo. And it's as much fun for the parent as it is yeah. for the child because you watch their reaction to it and it's just a ton of fun. 
Yeah. But yeah. the experience okay. the child has is yeah. is really valuable growing up. Okay. Have you ever been uh, very politically active, or are you pretty much just uh, you work on your Montessori stuff? And uh, no, I'm pretty politically active. Oh, are there <laughs> any candidates you've been in any groups you've been involved with, or any? Yes, I've been really worked I've, with her. Yeah, I've been involved in political groups and um, locally. My husband and I have been to caucuses, and then we've been. Uh, what's the next step after that? Where you're elected as to the next step? Conventions. Yeah, we yeah we've gone to some conventions, um, and then you know I've written a lot of articles for the American Thinker. Yeah, yeah, that's very fun to do. I've written letters to the editor and, you know, any, any way that I can get the word out there, I do. Yeah. So, is that, is that involved with the libertarian party or other, or just local candidates that you like or. Um, well, way, way back before I realized um, some things about the libertarian party that I later didn't like once I found out about them, um, I was involved with uh, a libertarian group, oh. um, but then <clears throat> no longer, it was just, you know, local um, candidates that we yeah. thought were good. And you yeah. know what, when you get involved in those caucuses, at least in Minnesota, you have an opportunity to influence the Republican party at the ground level yeah. because they will ask you to submit resolutions to the Republican platform, which my husband and I did. And some of them did get onto the Republican platform. Yeah. So it's really valuable to get involved. Yep. And then you can see how the party has changed over the years, which there are a lot of objectivists that don't realize that because they haven't been involved, but yes. it, it has changed a lot. Not that it's perfect by any means but there have been a lot of changes yeah so you you were mostly in minnesota I, I get the impression that you have in minnesota you have msp and then you have the rest of the state and it, there's a divide there i suppose isn't there well you mean like the big city is more minneapolis st paul and then you have right. the rest of the state i i mean i suppose that's the case because minnesota has just been this it seems like it's this leftist, this leftist bas this leftist paradise. But I, but obviously you have people all over the state too. So right when uh, <laughs> when Obama, I think it was Obama was running, or was it Trump? Maybe it was Trump. You know, the northern part of Minnesota uh, uh, is called the Iron Range, which is where they used to do a lot of mining of iron ore. And they have a reputation for being very, very leftist. But when Trump was running, there was Trump signs all over the place up there. And I know that for sure because we have a cabin in that area. And so I think it's changing, but to what extent, I don't know. Of course, in the city, the cities are pretty leftist. Yes. Um, but uh, it's you get out outside the city where people are actually being productive. You know, you get a different, different view. It seems that way. Of course, Minnesota was the only state that, uh, you know, that Walter Mondale got back in 1984. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's uh, been, been very interesting. Uh, so you so see you were in, in Minnesota. I don't know. Yeah. I just wanted to see how your politics were. Uh, since since I'm 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 very active with the LP, but the but certainly I what, what disillusioned you from the LP exactly? When was that? Well, the the idea that you can do whatever you want, I don't I don't like that. I mean, I yeah, you can do whatever you want. That doesn't make it moral, and that's my beef with them. And I think in order to have a moral country, you've got to pay attention to the morals. 
Yeah, there's definitely I definitely see some truth in that. There's a lot of people so that, that think that there 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 are some the more libertine libertarians. I I I I'd like to think that a libertarian society would kind of weed those people out, but I I realize there's always going to be people out there who make decisions that may not seem prudent. Well, uh, I think it's about time to wrap this up. This has been a really good talk. Is there anything else you want? Is there anything else you'd like to say before we close this? Well, <laughs> um, the other thing that I'm really passionate about is discipline. You know, yeah. I wrote that my book on effective discipline, the Montessori way. And I think that the country is going in a very, very bad direction with all these undisciplined kids. And I, you know, when I wrote my book, I studied the history of how this has come about and it all stems back to John Dewey. And there are a lot of objectivists who are uh, following the positive discipline approach, quote unquote, positive discipline what's positive discipline well you don't you don't say no to a child okay you don't give them a consequence for misbehavior you don't send them to time out and look at the results yeah what we have to do is look at the results of this and and uh it's really it's not good it's yeah not i think you yeah. know our yeah. Well, okay. Well, that's certainly been a good talk. It's a, uh, I should have asked you, did you have kids yourself? What? Did you have kids or you mentioned, you know, teaching Montessori. You've had kids or I never asked. Yeah, we, my husband and I adopted two girls oh. and then he had two boys from a previous marriage. Okay. So that's good. So, it's, and, and okay, well, that's, yeah, I, I don't know why I didn't ask that, but that's, yeah. So, okay. Okay. Well, thank you again, Charlotte. This has been a very good talk. I will certainly be uh, sending you a link. And I, I'm going to also share this video with some other people I, who would definitely be interested in the topic of what's going on with the, the wokeness in the Montessori movement. I hope, I hope we can fix that issue. I, although I'm, I, you know, it seems like it's going to, die a natural death but i'm afraid there's also a lot of money behind it so i don't know how much damage it's going to do before it's yeah well i am glad to see that there's a yeah. lot of pushback there's an organization called moms for liberty which i yes. i talk about them on my website and okay. uh, they're i'm seeing them on tv and everything <clears throat> yes what you, you might want to give your, your website also is it just it's authentic montessori education.com Authentic Montessori education.com. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Charlotte. Do. All right. We'll see ya. Have Thanks. a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.